Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 So we're there in Philippians chapter 2. And what I want to preach to you about this morning is desiring vain glory. Desiring vain glory. Of course, vain glory is probably not a word that we use often today. It's not something we hear uh, uh, in our vocabulary. But what it means is uh, an excessive or ostentatious pride, especially in one's, own, uh, in one's achievements. So vainglory is somebody who is overly proud about the things that they have accomplished in life. It is a vain display or show. It is what we would call vanity today. So really what we see here in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, is that vainglory essentially is the opposite of what Paul is admonishing these people to do. He says there, let nothing be done uh, through strife or vainglory, but let in lowliness of mind let each esteem other, other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So lowliness of mind, you know, is, is the opposite of being high-minded. So if we were to say a person was uh, full of vain glory, <clears throat> you could say that they were very high-minded. You know, he's saying here, don't be high-minded. He's saying do everything through lowliness of mind. So we would say that, you know, that's associated with being vainglorious or someone who desires vainglory. And that's very true. If you were to look at people that would say they're very proud, they're very puffed up, they're very high-minded, often it's the very same people that would like to boast of their own accomplishments. They take a lot of pride in the things that they have done. And if you would, keep something in Philippians this morning, but turn over for, to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. We can get a better sense of what this word means, this word vainglory when we start to look at what it's associated with often in Scripture, and often it's associated with being puffed up, with being regarding one's own self better than another. Look here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, where it says, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded. So there it is again. In Philippians chapter 2, he's telling them to do everything in lowliness of mind. And here you have a group of people that are being reminded not to be high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Now does that not sound exactly like what we read about in Philippians chapter 2 where he says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So it's that same admonishment again to not be high-minded, to be ready to distribute, to be do everything out of lowliness of mind, and to be able to also look on the things of others, not on one's own self. So we would see that, you know, uh, to, uh, to be uh, vainglorious is to consider yourself before another. It's to be puffed up in your own mind and really to just be a self-centered person or somebody who is just concerned with themselves. <clears throat> we could also compare it to Philippians chapter 2, if you would. Turn over there, Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. <clears throat> if we were to be one who is not desiring vainglory, then we would be one who does not make ourselves of any reputation. We would not be one who is especially proud in their own achievements. We would not be one who wants everybody to know about all the things that we have accomplished. We would not be concerned with our own reputa reputation. As it says there in Philippians 2 where we were reading, continuing on in verse 7, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Of course, this is talking about Jesus Christ and what he did. And he is our example. That is what we should... Uh, that is what we should strive to do. That should be uh, the pattern that we follow in our life, that we are not going to be those that would lift up ourselves and be concerned with our own reputation and making sure everybody knows who what our name is and what we're doing and what we're about. But we should be like Christ who made himself of no reputation. And he was there to do uh, what we ought to do, which is to look on uh, the things of others. It's not, not what Christ did for us when he came and looked on our own uh, needs and he died for us. So that's what it means to, to be vainglorious. You would, you would, we would uh, oppose these, these attributes here. We'd say, well, a person who's vainglorious would not uh, uh, make themselves with no reputation, but they would actually esteem themselves better than others. But, and that is not what we are to do. Of course, we see this in the world, isn't it? I mean, the world, we can look at the world, and this is not uh, you know, uh, something that's lacking in the world. There's a lot of vainglory that goes on in the world. Especially in the world we could look at of professional sports would be one example. Right. I mean, you know, there's, there's the professional sports is something where, where people, men are lifted up for their ability to run and catch a ball and throw a ball and, and do this and that. And of course, we would look at some of the things that they do and, and, you know, and uh, their physical uh, attributes and abilities are impressive, you know, as far as man is concerned. But it, take, it gets taken to another level. Right. I mean, they, they, are, they are lifted up like gods almost and, and, and venerated and worshipped and and people are you know, clamoring for their autographs and things like that. 
And that is a form of vainglory. And when they think that they are better than others, they would say that they are, uh, you know, that what they can do makes them a superior person. And I'm sure not every you know professional athlete is like that. But do I really have to take the time to, to point out professional athletes who would maybe look down on others and yeah. uh, esteem themselves better than others? There are very there are people who are very out for their uh, out for their own benefit. They're more concerned with what's going going on in their life than they are with the life of others. Which is really what demand that 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 uh, that occupation demands of them. I mean, they have to be training and, and very self-centered and, and, and only concerned about the things that you know that uh, are going to help them accomplish their goals in that in that uh, in that endeavor of professional sports. And then we can look at the example of of uh, like the Oscars, right? I mean, you want to talk about vain glory. You want to talk about people lifting themselves up right. and just patting themselves on the back yeah. and saying, "Look at us, how great we are!" And, and who did better this year than the other person? And, and voting on who did, was the best actor and who was the best actress and supporting actress and supporting actor and, and director and producer and all and all, so on and so forth. And it's the same group of people all voting for each other. Right. You know, it's, not like, it's not like they're going to the masses and saying, now what do you think? You know, it's a board that's selected and they're, you know, they're all uh, choosing amongst themselves who did better than the other one. So that's really not, you know, uh, somebody who's, who's uh, uh, disconcerned with their reputation. I mean that's like a big deal, you know, to 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 be a runner-up. You know, you were you were uh, nominated, right? But you never won. I mean that that person would be very. Uh, they would rather win. Why? Because they have a. Then they could say that they are a uh, you know two-time Oscar-winning actor, you know, or, or whatever it is. You know, they, they they tout that you know when they when they go out and promote other films and things like that. <clears throat> we can see the example of social media, and really this would probably come a little bit closer to home for us where people could go on social media and really just kind of brag about their own accomplishments or brag about whatever thing that they've uh, been able to do. And, you know, that's something that we have to be careful of, that we don't fall into this trap of becoming vainglorious. We should not desire vainglory. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, I'll read to you, A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. And really that describes the world today. That describes a lot of what we see in professional sports, and in the, the entertainment industry, and if we're not careful, even in our own lives, where we just want to discover ourselves and, and make sure that you know we could uh, find out what we're capable of, and, 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 and touting that and, and bragging about it, and that's something that we have to be on guard about because desire for uh, vain glory that can infect and infect uh, the Christian as well. You know, we we're not surprised when the professional athlete you know uh, wins the, the whatever cup, whatever championship, and and they have the parade where they go up and down the streets and they're and, you know they're spending their day with the, the Stanley Cup and making jello in it or putting their baby and putting it on Instagram <laughs> and doing all these silly odd things and being lifted up by man that doesn't really surprise us it doesn't surprise us that the unsaved uh, you know entertainment industry is just more concerned with their own reputation than other people that doesn't surprise us but we should be surprised when we find a child of God a servant of God who's more concerned about their reputation or being known or having some kind of uh, uh, vain glory uh, about them. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 23 of the Pharisees, it says, but all their works they do for be dis uh, to be seen of men. You know, Jesus admonishes us in Matthew uh, chapter 5 and 6 to, to pray in secret and to, and to not uh, do our alms in secret and to not to be seen of men, that we should... Be careful to not let the things that we do for God to be uh, seen of men, so that our Father, which seeth in secret, may reward us. Yeah. And this is an attitude that can creep in. We say, well, that would never affect me, but it does affect us. It does creep in. And it's something we always have to be on guard about, is this desiring vainglory. And Jesus said very specifically of the Pharisees that the reason why they did all the things that they did was to be seen of men. And uh, there's a, obviously a great work that we've been given to do. There's a lot of work that we have to do. And it's a tough work. It's a, it's a work that uh, requires dedication and sacrifice. But we have to be careful that just because we're accomplishing that work that we don't allow ourselves to become puffed up and thinking, well, I'm doing something that nobody else is doing. You know, all these other people are just lame and we're better than them. And what we can end up doing is actually puffing ourselves up and even desiring vainglory that other people would acknowledge the fact that we are doing greater works than some other people. And, you know, and that all comes by means of comparison, which is a really bad way of judging how well you're doing. To go and find some loser and say, well, he's not doing anything. I'm better than him, so I must be doing great. That's not really the, 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 the bar that we strive right. to achieve. 
Yeah. <clears throat> and really, this type of thing, you know, of course, we could apply to probably uh, that I've seen and noticed, you know, in a practical way that we could apply this to our life uh, because we are a soul winning church, is in our methods of soul winning. And this is something that I think uh, we have to be on guard about is to not, uh, you know, puff ourselves up about the, the things that we do for God, and specifically in the area of soul winning. And uh, one thing I've noticed or seen, and something that, uh, you know, not, not, I'm not just saying in this group here, but I'm saying just in general, you know, I, I'm kind of in a tough spot because I, everyone always thinks I'm preaching about them when I'm down here. But you have to remember that I, I do this, I go to the Indian reservations, I lead soul winning time in, in Phoenix, I'm involved up there. So don't feel like I'm picking on you, but you know what? If it applies, then it applies. You know, right. and I'm just right. going to throw it out there because if it's not us, we need to be on guard to make sure that it doesn't become us. So <clears throat> what what I notice is that there's people who become vainglorious. It creeps in. What they start to do is to inflate the numbers uh, of, of, of people they get saved. I've seen this, where you'll be out somewhere and it seems like it's always the same group of people. You know, uh, you go out to the same area, you'll drop off the same. You know, uh, several different people in an area. And several groups will come back and they'll say, well, we only had a few saved. We had one, two, three, or four, maybe. And then one group come back and says, we have 15. We had 15 people saved. We had 15. <laughs> and praise God if they did. And I'll say, I'll say, well, I assume you're preaching to children. And oftentimes you say, yeah, there was a group of kids and things like that. But I've also noticed other times where, you, you know, there's a seed of doubt. And, and that's usually a red flag to me when I see people that are always coming back with 15, 20s, you know, and just these high numbers. And you have to start to scratch your head and wonder, why is that? Why are these numbers, this one group of people, these, these certain people always coming back with these very high numbers? Well, one, it's either because they're vainglorious, because they're just looking to be known as those that just get a, a multitude of people saved every time they, you know, they, they knock on the door. It's the Philippian jailer just throwing themselves at their feet and, and saying, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And, and it's just, they're just there at the right place at the right time. And maybe that's so, but I have to tell you, I have a little bit of doubt about it. Yeah, right. Or it could be because, not because they're being puffed up and being glorious, it could just be because that they have very poor soul winning methods. And that's something we have to really be on guard about, is, is that people who will never develop their soul winning methods and get more efficient and better at it because they, they like being able to just report high numbers. They like the fact that they're not being thorough because then they can come back with a number and say, I've got all these people saved. They will practice poor soul winning methods simply to report higher numbers. Now, I, I certainly hope that's not the case. I certainly couldn't point at any one person and say, yeah, this is the case with them. But it's definitely something that's possible and something that you know I've, been, uh, I've wondered about. It's really more of a hypothesis that I have or a theory that, that, that I'm not saying it's something that's definitely happening. But it's not beyond the realm of possibility to say that yeah. type of thing happens, that people <clears throat> would go out and practice poor soul winning methods just so they could come back and have a higher number than somebody else. Well, let me tell you something. That's, <clears throat> that's vain glory. If that's you, if you want to go out and just come back, and so you can raise your hand when the, when the soul winning is counted up, and just get the the uh, the thrill of you know reporting some high exaggerated number. Um, and, you know we want our numbers to be accurate. We really do. I'm more interested in accurate numbers than high numbers. The Bible says in Exodus 23, "Thou shalt not raise a false report." You know we shouldn't be going out seeking and just making up things, making up reports, coming back and just saying things that aren't so. You know, we might even believe that they're true in our heart. We have to ask ourselves, is what we're saying really true? Is that really what happened out there? You know, I'm more interested in sincere numbers than big numbers. We were out on the reservation uh, this last trip out there, and there was a lady that was going soul winning, and she came back, and she was disappointed because she only got one person saved. And you know, and I don't care if you come back with zero people saved, because the command is to go. Right, you know, right once now. you've done yeah. that, you've accomplished everything God has told you to do. Amen. To go out and preach the gospel. And uh, you know, here's the thing: she came back with one, but I said, you know what? That's a I, that's a sincere number. Uh -huh. I had more faith in that than the person who came back and said we got 15. You know, maybe they did get 15. And praise God, I marked it down. You know, I've said in the past from this pulpit, I'm not responsible for your numbers. You know, you're responsible for the numbers that you report. What am I supposed to do? Go around and double check on everybody if I get a suspicion? Like, all right, now you take me back and point out every person that you said you got to let the word, and I'll double check them. You know, that's that's not on me. That's on that's on the uh, those that are reporting those yeah. numbers. Yeah. <laughs> so I was I w I just reminded this lady. I said, look, you you might have only gotten one saved today, but chances are you know you got that one person saved. Right. You know, rather than uh, the other the other folks who just have these incredibly high numbers. So we see that's one form of vainglory that we can apply to our own lives because we are a soul winning church that goes out and knocks doors and preaches the gospel. 
is that we have to be careful not to come back with the false reports simply so we can make ourselves into something that we're not. Right. <clears throat> you know, or people, how about this, who make sure others know about their soul winning efforts. You know, they go soul winning, they gotta let make sure everybody knows about all the soul winning that they do. You know, that's a wrong motivation to go soul winning, to make sure that everybody knows that you're soul winning. You know, we should go soul winning because we want people to get saved. Right. You know, and I don't doubt that's the, the, the motivation of everybody in this room. But we have to be careful not to let the desire for vainglory to creep in because it's so easy to do. To, to make ourselves and your reputation. You know, we're, we're part of a, 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 the new IFB movement. We're part of a, you know, we're not a denomination, denomination necessarily, but, you know, we are a, a group of people that is made up of, of, of younger folks that have grown up with technology and have learned to use it. And we're connected with other churches of like mind and faith uh, around the country and around the world. And, you know, we could probably stand up here and I could start to name names for you of people that I've only known from online that all of you know. Yeah. So there's a real possibility, there's a real temptation to have our names out there as somebody. To be known over, you know, in Florida. To be known in Atlanta. To be known, uh, you know, in, in uh, Vancouver. To be known. To know who my name, when I show up, they all recognize me. They know who I am because I put myself out there as something. And I'm not saying it's wrong for people to know one another, but I'm just saying if all you're concerned about is developing a reputation in some online community, or to be known of men, you know, your motivation is wrong. Right. And you need to double check that. <clears throat> and make sure that you're doing things out of a sincere heart and for, uh, for the right reasons. You know, another area that this can creep in is in the area of preaching. You know, we talk about soul winning, how people can be uh, desiring vainglory to make a reputation for themselves as as some uh, you know great soul winners, and I you know what there are a lot of great soul winners that I know. You know I could name for you people that I think are great soul winners, and, but and the, but there are people that aren't uh, going out of their way to uh, develop that reputation. There are people that are uh, genuine. They have a burden for law, the lost. They're faithful to the, the soul winning times. They go out week in and week out. They, they're thorough with their gospel presentation. They're more interested in getting sincere, true, accurate numbers than they are just praying a prayer with somebody. And uh, so I'm not saying that um, it's not a, it, you know, there are great soul winners out there. But we need to be careful that we don't uh, just desire to be known that way. And that's in the area of soul winning. But another area that this desire for vainglory can creep in is in the area of preaching. You know, the people who get up and fill the pulpit. You know, I'm, not, I'm probably preaching only to myself at this point, right? <laughs> but this is, this, is a, this is reality. You know, if, if we ever uh, get an opportunity behind, to preach behind a pulpit here or elsewhere, you know, we need to make sure that we're, we're, we're doing that because we want to edify the body that is there. You know, we're more interested in the people that are filling the pews, the flesh and blood that's there, uh, the hearts and minds of the folks that are, are, are there for the preaching, you know, in the flesh not to entertain you know the people on the camera and that's and that's something that we have to be careful of as preachers always on guard about if you would turn over to first Corinthians chapter 14 first Corinthians chapter 14 <clears throat> these people can fall into this they really can I know when I first started preaching you know anytime I got to fill the pulpit in Phoenix you know for the next two or three days I'm, I'm examining every comment that is made on my preaching, you know, and I'm getting called names, and other people are saying it's great, you know, and, and that I have, other people are saying I have a fat, dwarven face, <laughs> which is one of the best insults I've ever heard, you know? so, um, <laughs> anyway, that's kind of a long story, but the point I'm trying to make is, you know, when I first started out, I was really concerned with what everybody on the line was, was going to say about me, and I had to check my heart and say, you know what, that's the wrong motivation, now, now I'm preaching, and, and, and I, I don't even think to check the comments, often because it's just a bunch of, it, it really is a bunch of trolls a lot of times right, anymore. Yeah. But, you know, um, I'm more concerned of what the people in the pew are, if they're being edified, if they're being helped, rather than just the online community. Look here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 18. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than y'all, yet in a church I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. I love how he says there, yet in the church I would rather speak. You know, that's that's what we have to be concerned about, those that are in the church. That's who we should be concerned oh, about edifying, it's those that are there. You know, he's more concerned with those that are in church, not those that are on YouTube and, and trying to get, you know, I'd rather speak five words here that edify the body than get 10,000 likes. Now, I, you know, I mentioned I don't read the comments anymore, 
you know, <coughs> that's because really there's nobody commenting on the Tucson channel. <laughs> you know, but so what? You know, I, I, I get comments here. You know, people say, you know, good sermon. And I say thank you. You know, it's the, it's the Word of God. And, and I'm glad for that. And I'm Amen. glad that, there, you know, it's more satisfying to come here and actually edify real people living real lives that you can see their lives change and then grow than it is just to have somebody in some video go viral. You know, and people, they, they, this happens with preachers. This is something that people can fall into. Is that they become more concerned with going viral than with edifying the body. You know, and here's the thing. There are a lot of sermons that go viral. I mean, there's a lot of clips. I've made clips that have gone viral of preaching, from, of other preachers. You know, Pastor Anderson, he, uh, he's got videos that go viral. People pick that up, whether for good or bad, they try to, they run with it. Um, you know, they try to, to use it against him often, which is, is, is really odd because he's the one that put it out there anyway. But there's a lot of videos that do go viral. But I guarantee you that those preachers that go viral, that's not their motivation. Right. It's to go out there and see if they can just, you know, go viral. You know, that's something that just kind of happens in and of itself. And that happens when you're preaching, you know, for the right reasons to begin with. When you're preaching uh, with the Holy Ghost and for the right reasons. So, you know, we don't want to fall into this vain, glorious type of uh, attitude where we want to, we're more concerned with going viral than actually edifying the people uh, in, in, in the church. Because really that's more satisfying. And I think that's what I've learned the most. You know, I consider myself to be an intermediate, intermediate preacher. You know, I've got a lot of room to improve. Don't amen that. You know, there's a lot of room for growth, right? <clears throat> but, uh, you know, and that goes for all of us. You know, and that's a lifelong thing that we should always endeavor to improve. Soul winning or preaching or whatever it might be. Right. But I've learned in my short time doing this, as I said already, that it's more satisfying to preach to, to, to folks here than to get some nice comment or yeah. to get 100 views, you know. There hasn't been 100 views on a Tucson channel since Brother Oliver was here. And yes, I checked into that. Right? <laughs> now, I could get all big glorious, but why do I get 100 views, you know? And, and, or why aren't the videos on the Tucson two two most viewed ones on my sermons and, and really get worried about it? But what's that going to do? What, what, what is that type of a motivation going to do yeah. to the quality of the preaching behind this pulpit? Yeah. I'm going to be trying to achieve something that's not going to help you. Either. You know, I'm going to try and just, you know, preach about the sodomites every other week and see if I, you know, uh, if I can get some protesters out here. And I'm not, you know, Amen. I don't object to the protesters coming. You know, if I preach something and they show up, but if I make that my only goal, you know, what good is that to any of you? Yeah. Right. How is that going to help you in your marriage? How is that going to help you in your child rearing? How is that going to help you, you know, live the Christian life? Because there's a lot of things that we need to know and understand from the Word of God that have to be taught. Yeah. And if a preacher just gets puffed up and all he desires is vain glory, the people that are actually there that matter the most are going to be ones that suffer the most. Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> and here's the thing I've also found. It's actually, when you have that right motivation where you just want to edify the body, it's actually easier than going viral. You know, going viral is not easy. You know, I, I would assume, you know, if, if that's something that you're going to try to achieve. You know, you have to really get yourself out there and you have to, you know, get, you know, get your channel noticed and all the algorithms and the tags and the hashtags and everything else you got to put in there and, and, and really... You have to really try hard to get noticed in social media and really get your name out there and build up a channel. And then eventually YouTube just comes along and slaps it down anyway and you got to start all over again. <laughs> it's actually easier to just get up and take the Word of God, you know, and have the Spirit of God and just preach His Word and let Him do the work. Amen. That's what I love about preaching is that if you just preach this book, He does all the heavy lifting. Amen. Right? He, he does all the work. It's just our job to get up and just preach what it says. Yeah. <clears throat> You know, in this area of desiring to preach for vain glory. And if you would, turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 3. You know, we talked first of all, of course, about uh, desiring to be seen and heard of men in the area of preaching. But another, another way this manifests itself in the area of preaching is when you have people who persist in being pastors that are disqualified. That should not be pastors. That should be sitting down and letting... You know, either joining another church or having somebody else fill in that pulpit that they're filling. People who do not meet the biblical qualifications yet persist in being a pastor. I'm telling you something, that type of person, that's a big red flag. And I say that is probably somebody who's more concerned with vainglory than actually serving Christ right. for the right reasons. If you would, look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Because believe it or not, God actually lays out the qualifications for a bishop. God actually is very specific about it. Look here in verse 1, he says, This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. You know, first of all, right out of the gate, we have to understand that if you want to be a pastor, if you want to be a bishop, you desire work. You know, you're desiring to, 
you know, not just get up and preach, uh, you know, a couple times a week. That's, you know, and be seen and have people hear you and fall in love with your own voice and so on and so forth. You're desiring the work that goes into it. You know, um, just as the deacon down here, I can tell you, you know, learning to preach three times a week, it takes a lot of work. It takes time to actually, you have to sit down and schedule time. You have to, uh, to, to go, you know, write the sermons, hours that go into it. You have to actually know the Bible. You have to actually read the Bible. You have to actually be found in the Word of God, walking in the Spirit. And that's just that part of it. There's a lot of other things, you know, and I'm not, I'm not a pastor, obviously, but, uh, you know, I've got to see a little bit behind the scenes what goes on in the pastor being involved in the ministry full time. There is a lot of work, and you know what it is? It's a lot of little details. It's a lot of little things that have to be kept on top of, um, and, and it's important. There's, and not to mention the fact that there's people involved. You know, people who have problems, people who have needs. Um, you know, you've got to get in there, and as I've uh, said earlier in another sermon, you have to be willing to get your hands dirty. And, and dealing with people sometimes is not always the easiest thing to do. Sometimes you have to give people really hard news or tell them something, hey, you're not right in this area, you need to fix this. That's not easy. That's, that takes work. So right out of the gate, you know, if you desire the office of a bishop, you're desiring work. It's not just so you can go on easy street and just take it easy. You know, it's, it's doing the work of an evangelist, you know, making the maps, going out there, knocking the doors, leading people, organizing people, which sometimes can be like herding cats. If you, you know, if you ever try to get a group of people to go and do a certain thing in a certain amount of time and get back to a certain place, you know, people... So not everybody's on the same page sometimes, and it takes a lot of work. So, you know, right out of the gate, you got to desire the work. What is your motivation to be a pastor to begin with? Because people, they want to be a pastor for the wrong reasons, because they want vain glory, they desire vain glory. Look at verse 2. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. You know, that would probably root out a lot of pastors that are standing right. behind a pulpit today. They've been divorced and remarried, and the Bible says right there, they are to be the husband of one wife. And they got all their cute little ways of getting around this. Well, it's the wife, or the husband of one wife at a time. You know, not being a polygamist. Are you, are you kidding me? Do you think that's what the Bible means there? No. It, and your Bible elsewhere condemns, you know, divorce and remarriage. It calls it adultery right. several times. You know, go read the go read the Sermon on the Mount. Go read Matthew chapter five. <clears throat> so you know, if you've been divorced, you know, uh, you cannot be a pastor. The Bible's very clear about that. The husband of one wife. Vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. You know, if you have children that go wayward, that go and live for the devil, that, you know, it just it becomes a pattern with all your kids that they just go off and they, they turn out wrong. You have not ruled your house well. Right. And you, you are disqualified from the pastorate. <clears throat> because how are you supposed to, like it says here, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? You know, how are you going to uh, be put yourself up as an example to say, do as I have done, do with your children as I have done. Use the, the principles found in the Bible and, and your children will turn out the, for God. How can you say that if they're not turning out for God? You're, you're, you're bringing a reproach upon the Word of God. <clears throat> Look, go over to first Tim, or excuse me, Titus chapter 1. God repeats a lot of these uh, qualifications. Because here's the thing, God's serious about these qualifications. These aren't just like, you know, gray areas. These aren't just things that you can get most of it. You have to get them all if you want to be a bishop, if you want to be, uh, you know, a pastor. And we got a lot of guys today that are getting up behind pulpits and they're even taken aside and told by other men of God, you do not meet the biblical qualifications of a pastor and need to step down. There's men that have been told that, and yet they persist. Say, well, you know, I'm called. Well, you're, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't understand what, why would God call you if your life doesn't line up with the qualifications? Right. You know, that's your own imagination. Right. That's something you've thought up. It says in uh, Titus chapter one verse five, "For this cause I left you in Crete, that thou should have said in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife." There it is again. Having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. So again, there's the same qualifications repeated. And it goes on. But those are two major areas that a lot of pastors fall short in. That, and have, I'm, I'm sorry, have disqualified themselves. And they need to sit down. Excuse me. But why, why is it that they don't sit down? Why is it that they don't remove themselves and let another fill the pulpit? Because they desire vain glory. That's why. <clears throat> 
Look here, go down to verse 10. Why are these qualifications so important? For there are many unruly and vain talkers, deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped. You, you know why you have to be vain, blameless in these areas? You know why you have to have your house in order? Because you need to be able to go and silence the mouths of vain talkers. Right. And you can't have a person who's desire, desirous of vain glory himself uh, in that position because he's not going to be he's not going to bother to go after these people, or they're going to have something that they can point at. You know, they're going to be able to reproach him. <clears throat> you know, these people they're more interested in self promotion than the cause of Christ, and that's really you know that could affect any of us, not just as uh, pastors or preachers, but this can affect anybody when we become more interested in just promoting ourselves than trying to promote Christ, than the cause of Christ, and accomplish the work of Christ. Go over to uh, 3 John, if you would. 3 John. The Bible says, Let a, another man praise thee, and not thine own lips. You know, there's nothing wrong with being promoted. There's nothing wrong with you being praised. But when you're praising yourself, when you're promoting yourself, when it's your own lips that are praising you, you have to stop and check yourself and say, am I desirous of vain glory? And the answer is probably yes. <clears throat> it says here in uh, 3 John verse one, or chapter 1, verse 9, look here, it says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminent, preeminence among them, receiveth us not. So John is talking about a guy named Diotrephes here, and it says that he loves to have the preeminence. You know, he wants to be the one that everybody knows. He wants to be the one that everyone looks to. He wants to be the one that has the final say in everything. And, and so much so, uh, where it says in verse 10, Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, pratting against us with malicious words. I mean, this guy is so full of himself and so puffed up and so interested in his own uh, in promotion and having the preeminence that he's cutting down the man of God, the, the Apostle John himself. That he's speaking against him with malicious words. That he's dragging his name through the mud. And he's not content therewith, neither did he receive it, uh, himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would. Even other people say, no, Diotrephes, you should let these guys in. He's saying, no. He's even forbidding those people and saying, you know what, if you're going to side with them, you can't be here. And he's running these people out of the house of God. <clears throat> he casteth them out of the church, it says there. Now here's the thing. You know, how does that apply today? Well, you know, I've been in, in this church for several years now, and what I've noticed is a pattern especially online, of, of people who align themselves and people who associate themselves with faithful word with Pastor Stephen Anderson in order to, for the simple thing to just gain a following. Because, you know, they'll, they'll say all the right things, they'll do all the right things, they'll preach all the right doctrine, and then they'll gain a following, and because they love the preeminence, and because they're vainglorious, because they're more interested in their own selves, their own reputation, than the actual work of Christ, eventually, once they feel like they've got enough people, that's when they come out against Pastor Anderson. I tell you why he's wrong. And why he, they, they pray against him with malicious words. And if you side with him, then they, they reject you. And this happens over and over, folks. I mean, I can name names. It's, and it's gone on time and time again. Where we see people who will just align themselves with the man of God simply to gain a following. So that they, they and because they have the wrong motivations, uh, you know, they, they, uh, they, they end up turning on them. And it's, an, it's an unfortunate because here's the thing. You know, what's the big deal about that? Because babes in Christ get caught up in it. Babes in Christ, they go along with that, and then you know they're tossed about, you know, to and fro with every wind of doctrine, mm -hmm. and then these people deceive them, and they and they end up, you know, people who otherwise could have lived a productive, healthy Christian life and done something real for God, just end up being internet bozos, right. and it's un it's unfortunate. You know, another area, and it's area of of preaching, desiring to be seen and heard of men. You know, it's when uh, sometimes you'll see, I've noticed people who try to outdo the other preachers. You know, they say, well, you know, so-and-so, he's real popular. Let me see if I can outdo him. Let me see if I can preach a more radical sermon. Let me see if I can get more people to, to share mine or whatever it is. They try to outdo other preachers in order to be considered better. Because they think, well, if more people know my name and more people know what I'm doing, no pe more people know about my sermon that I preach, then obviously I'm the better preacher. And what this ha what this leads to is people who start to preach, uh, you know, over the top subject matter, where just every other sermon is about, you know, the Nephilim, you know, de debunking Nephilim or debunking, you know, 
transvestite Nazi Eskimos or whatever, <laughs> just these crazy topics that they just are always coming up with. You know, the Illuminati this, Freemasonry that. It's, it's just, just over the top. Why? Because they're trying to outdo other preachers. Because they're trying to get noticed. They want their channel to be bigger. They want their notoriety to be out there. They're self-promoting. They're people who are not in it for the right reason. They're more interested in their own self-promotion than the cause of Christ. And they start to preach what has been called, what I agree with, clickbait preaching. Yeah. And that's yeah. a real thing yeah. that, that goes on. I'm not saying everybody. I'm not saying it's a lot. A lot of it's out there. But it, ha it is something that's taken place that I've seen. Right. Where people just have the clickbait preaching that goes on. Where they just have the, the weird thumbnail, you know, and the, and the odd title and a very strange subject matter that won't help you at all in your Christian life. You know, just so that they can get 1,000 views or 2,000 views or whatever it might be. Uh, if you would, turn over. If you have kept something in Philippians, uh, turn back to Philippians chapter 2 there. We're going to wrap it up there. But... Uh, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, I'll just read to you, For we dare not make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. The Bible says it's not a wise thing to sit down and compare yourself to another person and, just, and try to measure yourself uh, against what somebody else is doing. And to say, you know, and say well, that was, that's what makes me better. And that's a lot of time what, what people can do in this area of preaching. Or even in soul winning, they'll sit down and say, "Well, I get more souls one than them, and must be better." Or I, my, you know, my channel, my, I have more subscriptions and more views. You know, I must be better. You know, that's not the measure. And if you're doing that, you're not wise. Why? Because your motivations are wrong, and you're in it for the wrong reasons. It's you're desiring vain glory. You're puffed up, and you need to get that right. <clears throat> because here's the thing about that: there will always be others that are better. And that's when I figured out there's always, no matter how good I get at anything, which isn't a lot of things, you know, but no matter how good I ever think I get at anything, there's always somebody better. Always somebody that can do more or, or do it better. You know, every sermon, you know, uh, could be better. You know, every sermon I've ever preached, I, I, I already know, it could be better. You know, there, there, it could have been a better sermon. Somebody probably preached on the same topic or through the same chapter and did a better job than I did. But is that really what I'm worried about, just being the best? What I'm doing, what I'm trying to do in the preaching, what we should all do and have the right motivation is, did it achieve the goal? You know, did it edify the body of Christ? Was Christ glorified? Was somebody's Christian, did they, somebody drawn closer to Christ in their life? Did somebody get some sin out of their life? Did somebody get something right in their life? Did somebody add something to their life? Did they grow as, as God's child from what was preached? Not, was my sermon the best? Not, was my sermon better than somebody else's sermon? That's desiring being glory. And here's the thing about vainglory and why it's so dangerous. is because it leads to strife. If you notice there in Philippians chapter 2, these things are associated. It says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. So he's putting them together, and this happens a lot of times in Scripture. But, you know, and strife is not something that we want in our life. When, you know, strife is just conflict. You know, it's competing. It's it's uh, you know, backbiting. It's, it, it's, it's being vindictive towards one another. It's, it's being angry and upset. It's, it's, it's these bad things. And it's associated with being vainglorious. And why is that? It's because people who are desirous of vainglory, what do they do? They strive to outdo somebody else. You know, they'll create strife. It creates strife. They're, they're, they're just in a competition with everybody else. In whatever area it is, you know, they, want, they are vainglorious. They want their name to be known. They love the preeminence. It's their reputation that they want uh, to lift up and to be exalted. And they will begin to strive with others. You know, they'll find somebody else and they'll say, well, that person, you know, people consider that person to be better than me, so let me, let me strive against him. Let me see if I can drag him down. Let me create conflict. Let me promote myself. If you would, turn over to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. We'll in there. The Bible says in James chapter 3, James chapter 3, beginning in verse 13, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him, show, uh, let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. You know, if we're striving, if we're envying somebody else's success, if we're desiring that for our own selves so that others might know who we are, if we're vainglorious, 
know, the Bible says that's earthly. It says that it's sensual, and it says that it's devilish. Now, that's a wicked sin. Right. Being desirous of vainglory <clears throat> and, and striving with others, if you're envying others, if you're bitter against them at their success, and you're trying to outdo them, and that's your motivation in life, that's a wicked sin that we need to get out of our hearts. <clears throat> it goes on and says in verse 16, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, and then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. You know, people, you know, I don't know if this applies to anybody in the room tonight. I don't know. Or this morning, excuse me. But if it does, you know, you just need to admit it and get it right. You just need to admit it and get it right. You know, if there's, you know, obviously nobody in here is uh, promoting himself, you know, as a disqualified preacher, right? But, you know, those guys that are promoting themselves as pastors, when they're disqualified, you know what they need to do? They need to get out of the pulpit. Man. They need to sit down and shut up and let somebody else fill that pulpit. <clears throat> you know, there's plenty of room in the pews. There's plenty of room for people to serve God from the pews. There's plenty of work out in the field to do. Amen. You don't have to be behind this, this pulpit in order to accomplish something great for God. Right. You can do it from right where you're sitting. Right. So people who are desirous of vainglory, they don't belong in the pulpit. They should... You know, they should get out of the pulpit. You should shut down the YouTube channel. If all you're trying to do is just build some YouTube channel and get noticed on social media, you know, just shut it down. You know, fall out, you know, fall out of love with your own face and your own voice. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you see these channels and it's like you can just, it just, it just smacks of someone who's just in love with themselves. And they're, yeah, what they're saying might sound spiritual, but it just looks, the appearance is, you're not even a preacher. You're not even a pastor. You're not even... Somebody, uh, you know, that is any kind of an authority, but we're just all over the internet and we're lifting up our own selves. Shut down the YouTube channel. You know, people who need to be sincere in their soul winning. You know, this is probably the one that's the most important. Be sincere in your soul winning. Don't get so obsessed with the number. You know, and don't be so worried about whether or not you come back with a goose egg. You know, we, we, we come back from soul winning sometimes and we get nobody saved. Right. You know, we go to Awatuki with about 15 people and we usually get one person out of, out of seven teams sometimes. Wow. But hey, that's one person. Amen. Yeah. And it was worth it. I don't get bummed about it. I'm right. like, oh, man, why did we get 10? <laughs> you know, I was like, praise God, we got one. Right. Amen. You know, praise God, 15 people showed up and, and obeyed the command to go. Amen. Praise Amen. God for that. There's people that are faithful going into neighborhoods that are less receptive and doing the work they've been told to do. Yeah. You know, work on your methods and work on your practices. You know, focus on those things, and, and, and the numbers will come when, when it's appropriate, when you're in the right, in the right neighborhood. <clears throat> you know, so verse 18, it shows us here, verse 18, James chapter 3, it shows us the proper attitude. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. You know, the fruit of righteousness is when you're going out and you're sowing in peace. You're doing it out of, for the right reasons. The work of God is done in peace. It's not done out of strife. It's not done out of vainglory. It's not caring, you know, it's not, uh, it's done in peace. You know, not caring what other, whether or not others notice. You know, I have great peace about coming down here and preaching and going soul winning with you folks and, and not have, being ever noticed. You know, I, I'm doing it in peace. I don't mind. Because we're we're accomplishing something now. Amen. We Amen. know it. You know, Amen. God knows it. Go well, look at the map over there. It's, it's getting filled in red. Amen. You know, and, and we're gonna we're gonna continue to do a great work down here. Right. And if we're ever the only ones that ever know about it, so be it. Amen. I have, I'm because I'm doing it in peace, and so are you. We're doing it for the right reasons. We're sowing in peace, right? <clears throat> not we're not caring what others uh, think or whether or not they notice. You see, the work of God, you know, it has, if we're doing the work of God and for, out of the right reasons, the results that come, you know, it says there that when we sow in peace of them that make peace, you know, what's that referring to? We make peace with who? Between lost, sinful people and God. And that is worth more than anything else, any recognition, any vainglory that this world has to offer. You know, that, that is a result that matters in eternity. And there will be a day. You know, maybe you'll so be a soul winner your whole life and you'll never hear your name from the pulpit. You'll never hear anyone lift you up and praise you for the work that you're doing for God on this planet, on this earth. But there will be a time when we, every man will stand before God and give account for the things which he hath done, whether they be good or bad. 
There, you know, Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his works. Amen. You have a reward coming. You will be acknowledged by the Lord Himself. Amen. I mean, who cares what anybody else thinks? If God says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And that's all that matters. Because that's that's the real result that we're looking for. Peace is made between man and and a, whole, a sinful man and a holy God. That's what we're trying to accomplish. And whether or not anybody else recognizes us, uh, you or, or this group as a uh, of believers as a body here, whether or not we ever get recognized, it doesn't matter because we were doing the work out of the right motivations and not out of vain glory. Let's go ahead and pray.